This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Bob Easter, and it's my really my privilege to serve as, as uh, interim chancellor, I guess I should say vice president, as the titles change day by day. Whatever I do, I'm the pretender. But uh, seriously, I've looked forward to this now for a while. Uh, it's a nice evening for me because I get to go somewhere, sit down, and listen to a really good lecture. I, I enjoy, I enjoy that. This lecture series, is, as you know, has been part of our campus for a while now, and it it gives us a chance periodically to, to showcase some of the truly great scholarship that goes on on across our campus. And what better example than, than what we're about to hear this evening. I, I met Professor Foss for the first time two, three weeks ago, I guess, and we had a conversation. He was recently elected. Of course, you may know he's Professor of Design at the School of Architecture. Uh, he was recently elected as a fellow in the prestigious American Institute of Architects been on our campus, I think you said, since 1989. And I said, relatively newcomer, Bob, is that, uh, that's, that's, he's not even close. No. <laughs> uh, we, we tend to think of, of architecture in terms of building design, but I think he'll remind us this evening it, it has impact on our emotions and, and our, how we think about the way we live. I think if all of us have had experiences uh, Vietnam Memorial in Washington is something that is poignant for me as I go through there and one of my high school classmates' name is there and the architecture, the, the emotions that it evokes uh, is, is uh, part of the absence of buildings sometimes. Your New York and the Twin Towers don't, aren't there. It, it also suggests something that is a part of, of your emotional, emotional background. Well. Professor Paus is known for designing public places for private contemplation. He has designed memorials for Holocaust victims, Olympians, and veterans, to name a number of things. The Veterans Memorial in Springfield, I understand you had something to do with. And I hope those of you that haven't have an opportunity at some point to, to visit that. There's another memorial in Peoria County, uh, World War I and World War II veterans. His talk topic this evening is, as you can see, from Olympians to eco-monks. And I'm not really sure what that is, but I suspect the New York here. So I'm sure there'll be a good story as we get along with you. So please join me in welcoming Professor Austin. Evening, so uh, hopefully uh, the the, uh, the talk of the slides and uh, the there's also a reception afterwards will will all keep you warm. Um, let's see, I guess I have control of this. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, a series of, of projects tonight. It's uh, as as uh, Chancellor mentioned, I've uh, been teaching here full time since 1989. Uh, when I started here, I, I began uh, 
uh, what I would consider a, a critical or a reflective practice in architecture, which meant that I was able to um, choose the, the types of projects that I thought were most meaningful to me. And so I, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, a selection of projects that I've kind of uh, uh, pulled from uh, the, the various things that I've done that are particularly meaningful to me and um, I think create a, a continuity of, of values and ideas. So, okay, so lights down. Um, I wanted to begin with this quotation by, uh, from Kenneth Frampton, who uh, actually was on campus a couple years ago, serving as the uh, Plym professor for the School of Architecture. Um, and it, is, it comes from uh, a short but very influential article that he did, um, I believe it was probably first published in late 1980s, about the time that I came here to begin my practice, about critical regionalism. And uh, in the article, he talks about the importance of place, the importance of local effects um, for the creation of meaningful architecture, which transcends the university, universality of, of so much work that we see these days, whether it's big box stores or uh, buildings that could, uh, that could fit in almost uh, any continent, et cetera, et cetera, and starting to focus on local conditions. Um, I've had the opportunity while working here to, um, well, to do various competitions and projects around the world, but mostly to focus on projects that are um, in this area and very local, and uh, many of which are pretty much a mile from, from where we are right now. And uh, so those are the ones that I'm going to focus on for this uh, discussion and uh, can show you what, what I've been thinking. Um, what I wanted to do first before I get to any projects is to talk about a series of conditions. In, in uh, Professor Frampton's uh, uh, article, he talks about uh, some of the different qualities of place that can begin to um, influence architecture of a certain place. Um, this image uh, is taken, was taken east of, uh, east of town and was the October light, and anybody who's sensitive to the light in this area knows that there's this golden glow to the, uh, to the atmosphere in October on these bright, clear, sunny days when uh, the, uh, the, the corn and the soybeans begins to dry up, and I think it must be some kind of reflective, reflectance on the land. But you get these beautiful qualities of light in various times of the year. Um, and I think uh, the sensitivity to local light is one of the things that really uh, can impact the experience of architecture in a grand way. Simple geometry, uh, this is something that's all around us. And what I, what I like about this slide is the way that you start to see the relationship between the geometry of this uh, cast, this uh, tilt slab concrete wall on what looks like a storage or a warehouse building, and the, uh, the plowed furrows of the field that uh, very abruptly uh, connects to the, the building. Abstraction, so much of what we see in the landscape um, are very simple uh, geometric solids, um, uh, whether it's cubic or spherical, things like that. And um, I find that the, the abstraction and the, the beauty of simple geometry is another thing that uh, I'm very much drawn to um, in the landscape and, and uh, working with in my own design. Materiality, uh, the, the way that materials work over time is something that I, I, uh, I, I think is very important to architecture and that I try to bring into the work that I do with students. Um, I think that working with materials as an architect is like working with materials for a sculptor, of course at a bigger scale usually, but um, I, I think that the, the way that they weather, the way that they, they start to work uh, with each other, and the connections between them are extremely uh, important to uh, built architecture. Economy. Um, I, I can remember so one of my early experiences in practice was a, a debate in the office about whether you can do good architecture with a small budget. 
And I've always taken that as a challenge, and I think that there's really a, a, a distinct separation between cost um, and design, because I think that, that you can be creative in whatever um, the conditions that you're working with are. And I think that the economy is something that, you know, certainly we're very sensitive to these days. Um, and I think that uh, more and more we're going to have to find ways to uh, do creative things with maybe less excess and less waste. Archetypal form. Uh, I think this is a little different than the geometry because it starts to get into psychological values too. Um, but I think that there are certain forms um, and conditions that remind us of certain things, whether it's the pedimental form uh, that is about domesticity or uh, agriculture and various types of forms. And I think that because of the collective meanings of archetypal forms, we can begin to use some of the reference and the symbolism that they bring to, um, to human consciousness in the design process. Monumentality. Um, I took these, these images about a month ago, um, and uh, they're, th these are some abandoned coal bins north of Gifford along the uh, Illinois Central, well, Canadian Pacific now right away. Um, and I've always been intrigued with them. I finally went over to take a look at them and uh, document them. And I just find there's a, a, an incredible beauty both to the way they're aging, but also to the, the kind of um, uh, uh, the, the kind of brutalistic concrete monumental quality of these pieces in the small scale flat landscape. Uh, and then there's earth shaping. And uh, I, I showed three examples of earthworks here. The one on the lower right is uh, Cahokia Mounds. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that's basically a, a, a mound earthwork uh, mound made by the Mississippian culture, um, completely made by carrying baskets of earth up um, and completely done by hand. And look at the monumental scale of it. Um, it really becomes a, a very significant event. On the lower left um, is Serpent's Mound in central Ohio. Um, the specific purpose of it is, is unknown, but it was expected that it was that both of these were done in some type of ritual. Uh, Cahokia, there's been evidence that the, the tops of the mountains became uh, sacred places that were reserved for the elite of the society. No surprise there, I guess. Um, at the very top is, the, uh, is uh, a simple overpass um, on the prairie uh, over an interstate. And what I like about this is it begins to suggest if you start to think about the overpasses like this as earthworks, you can start to imagine the entire interstate system as one big um, earth, earth sculpture experience. And I find it's much more pleasant driving uh, 400 miles a day if I think I'm driving in an earthwork. OK, um, on to the projects. Uh, when, I, when I first came uh, in 1989, uh, there was a competition for a, uh, a local project, the uh, uh, Tribute to Olympic Athletes. And uh, I happened to, to win that competition and um, uh, was able to construct this uh, pretty early in my, my stay here. I uh, considered myself very lucky and fortunate to do it, and uh, even more fortunate to work with the Champaign Park District because they were excellent clients. As I worked on other, this is the only memorial I'm going to show tonight, but as I worked on other, uh, other memorial projects and with uh, other committees, I began to realize really how good the Champaign Park District was as a client because um, anytime you're working in a committee situation, uh, it can sometimes be problematic. As, as an architect, I'm sure, as other people. Um, anyway, uh, th these are some sketches of the initial conceptualizing of the project. And what I wanted to point out here was uh, using some of the qualities uh, that I uh, talked about earlier. Uh, you can see evidence of things like monu the monumental, monumental gateway, uh, which to me gets back to the idea of the archetypal form. Uh, trying to integrate that with an earthwork 
to me, the earthwork was important because I wanted to really ground, literally ground this in place. Uh, I felt that this was a uh, th this was a memorial to local athletes who had participated in the International Olympics. So I wanted to get the sense of the local integrated with the larger value. So it, to me, the, the symbolic value of the ground integrated with the archetypal value of the uh, gateway began to uh, fuse those two ideas together. Here is a, a, a final model of the piece, and you can start to see how those elements begin to work together. Uh, the material became also uh, an important quality of this. Uh, I was very interested in using something that would actually reinforce the, the notion of groundedness. And so I uh, naturally went to cast, cast in place concrete. Because cast in place concrete is a material which is molten until it's actually poured into a form and, and begins to solidify on site. So I felt that it, in a symbolic way, and I, to me an emotional way, begins to um, uh, form itself on the site. And so it has a very, uh, a very strong sense of locale. Uh, it's not something which is pre-manufactured and brought in to the site. Uh, we are also able to uh, cast the Olympic logo. And uh, this is the first and possibly last time that this Olympic logo is actually going to be used on a, 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 a non-commercial uh, usage. Because after they, they, they granted authorization to use the logo on this project, but then after that, they refused to allow it for other projects because they wanted commercial backing to do it. So uh, we may have one and only here in our community. Uh, this is a, a, an image that I really like and one that I can't recreate now because the trees have grown up. But I, I enjoy the way that this uh, cast in place silo that you see to the left there is, it's, to me, it's a kind of cousin to the Olympic Tribute Project as far as the material palette goes. Uh, once again, a kind of, uh, uh, the, this idea of the simple geometry um, that, that is rooted in the place. And uh, this is an example of it at night. Another aspect that we were looking at was of, of beginning to shape the gateway arch as well as the walkway to begin to create a kind of trompe l'oeil effect so that it looks like a forced perspective. The idea of this was um, uh, to somehow symbolize this idea of competition, the idea of uh, the, the elimination of competition, and finally you get to the final platform. And the platform is the honorary space which uh, is raised up again so that the leader on the raised platform um, and uh, the names of the uh, uh, athletes are engraved on a granite block. And uh, what this this project was done, actually the, uh, the, the uh, 20 year anniversary of this project is, uh, I don't feel like such a kid when I said that 20, my first project is 20 years old. But, um, the, uh, the anniversary of it is this July, this next July 4th. Um, and I've been in discussions with the uh, director of the, of the Champaign Park District about maybe doing a little um, minor repairs, really. It was well built, but it could use a little bit of work. Uh, but I've enjoyed watching it be uh, used by the community in various ways. Uh, when the uh, uh, 4th of July fireworks went out there, it became uh, a, a part, uh, part of that celebration. I've been able to watch, uh, see various Olympic athletes uh, basically uh, un, uh, uh, reveal their names different ceremonies that they've had there, including one where they, they uh, chose to include the Paralympians this summer at a ceremony, and that was a, a pretty interesting event to see. Um, while I was doing the Olympic, or when the Olympic tribute was in construction, I was um, interested in thinking about this notion of, of how you fuse the landscape and the geometry um, into other types of forms. And I came up, and this was more or less a theoretical study um, of, uh, of a house that I, enti uh, I uh, is entitled Prospect and Refuge. 
And it comes from uh, the landscape theory of Jay Appleton, which uh, is this notion of prospect being this long distant view, uh, has certain qualities of uh, protection, of feeling as if you're safe and secure in the landscape because you're raised up or you're protected and you can see for a long way to see if your enemies are coming. And then refuge, which is about being in shelter and safe places. And uh, there have been several uh, other people who've talked about this and its relationship to, say, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and other architects. And it's uh, a, a very interesting uh, uh, way to start to analyze the, the quality and the experience and the feeling of comfort in architectural space. So I was beginning to look at that and to uh, bring that into a project such as this, where it's just a very simple um, uh, raised foundation piece, which is then earth burned, uh, is a way of kind of collecting the landscape into, uh, into a mound, and then building some uh, additional uh, habitated space on top of that. That project then led to an, another project which uh, Series of faculty did uh, in the, the 90s uh, in the School of Architecture. We decided to uh, collectively work with um, work on a subdivision project that uh, a colleague of ours, Bruce Hutchings, was developing um, uh, called Ropes and Meadows, which I think you probably all know is uh, uh, out on Windsor Road. And uh, we decided to collectively uh, develop projects for. Uh, <laughs> the various sites of it, a specific cul-de-sac. This was my solution, and I was starting to look at this idea of taking um, what the, the Prospect and Refuge Project, which was intended for kind of wide open uh, uh, Midwestern landscape, and starting to define it for a much more uh, uh, specific subdivided residential type location. And uh, this is uh, obviously the, the poster child image too. Um, here's a model on the left-hand side here, and you can start to see, and you can see by the, the place of my project in the, use the screen, green thing now. There's, there's the location in the subdivision of the project. And one thing you can see is the way that, uh, well, Windsor Road is, is right here, and part of the development was to begin to create an earthen mound that uh, would give some visual and uh, audible separation between Windsor Road and the uh, plots of land that were adjacent to it. And I chose to take, take that land and start to move it into the uh, eastern boundary and also wrap the garage around it uh, and also filter it into the house here. So that uh, instead of what, what I was seeing at the, noting at the time was a lot of these uh, subdivisions where there would be this tremendous excavation and huge mounds of earth around. And then once the building was done, it would all be spread flat again. Uh, and then everybody complains about being in the flatlands. And I thought, well, maybe there would be a good opportunity to uh, make something more of it and start to look at how you can start to use the earth in the design. Um, and various people have done that. But I think that what, <coughs> what was interesting about this project was, hmm, excuse me. <coughs> dry throat here. But what was interesting about this project was the uh, idea of doing it on such a very tight site, basically a quarter acre site. <coughs> uh, it features a, uh, a major living space and then uh, a series of steps up to this uh, lookout space that look over in a kind of prospect way over the uh, landscape. <coughs> the, uh, the This Prospect Tower idea was something that uh, I found very exciting and uh, was the part that I think I was most intrigued with with this project. And once again, there's a certain vernacular quality to it. We see a lot of, of uh, articulated profiles in various projects uh, around the landscape. And uh, as you see on the left with this, uh, probably a, uh, some kind of conveyor tower on a barn. <coughs> And so that tower um, transformed into a series of small um, projects that uh, I've taken on. And these are three meditation huts that, <coughs> excuse me, that I've constructed so far. Um, 
the first two are Meditation Hut 1 and then, of course, Meditation Hut 2. Um, and those were both uh, built for my wife, who's in the audience there. And uh, they were uh, hand-built by, by myself um, and give her a place to uh, practice meditation. And um, then I had the opportunity to do this third one, uh, which is obviously a little, little taller off the ground. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, I'm not going to talk about the other two, but I will talk about this third one a little bit. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> first of all, the site. Um, the, the site is north of, uh, uh, north of Urbana in a small area of Champaign. And uh, the house itself was uh, being built, uh, and they, they were, the, the, ground is, the ground was in a floodplain, and so they had to do a borrow pit, which uh, was in, in itself is reminiscent of uh, what you would find around a, a major earthquake work like Cahokia Mounds. Uh, the, the ground was used to uh, build up the land around the, the house, and uh, at the same time it afforded this uh, wonderful pond uh, that was developed. You can see on the uh, very left-hand side there, the view through the house uh, to one of the locations that we're looking at for the meditation hut. The idea was to start to look at a series of different uh, projects for the site. Here you can see uh, in red their location of the meditation hut compare, uh, in relationship to the house. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, th this was the one of three sites that we were looking at for uh, the location of the meditation hut. Uh, this is a series of images that, or uh, models that I created uh, one summer to start to study the idea of form uh, for the project. We, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we were, the, the idea was to look at a series of forms and that would start to be, uh, to articulate the light and bring light into the, the piece in various ways. Several of the projects were designed for that pond edge site. Um, you can look at this one that's sitting on the bottom. Uh, it has a, a roof that's kind of slanted over so that it would start to reflect light into it. Uh, various things like this where you have a horizontal window that would begin to capture a small view of the water. So I was testing various things um, in, these, in these models. What we came up with was this project, which is uh, entitled Victor. Uh, obviously, it comes from the roof form. Uh, it, it features a, a very simple geometric uh, shape, two ge geometric shapes which are intertwined. Uh, the smaller one, which becomes the, the entrance space here, uh, a place to make tea and to take off your shoes, and then you have the major, the main meditation space, which is kind of, uh, kind of, um, created out of three tatami mats. And you can see that the, the, the hut itself is, is basically in the pond. It's raised up on stilts since this is in a floodplain, and we've uh, kept it so that most, that hopefully the, uh, the highest flood water is going to stay well out of uh, the space. And then there's this uh, cedar ramp that brings one up into the space. I'm going to take you through a series of images of this now. Um, here it is on the pond um, in early morning. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the V on top is, is, uh, has a white single ply roof and then uh, stained white cedar. And this is in homage to the house, which is all a very white uh, curvilinear surface. And then the cedar down below is uh, treated in a very natural way. It's red cedar. It'll turn into a kind of uh, warm gray as it weathers over time. Um, and so this, so the, the notion of time is brought into, uh, of course, the landscape around it, which is being developed, uh, and also into the, uh, the surfaces of the, of the project itself. Here's a, a recent picture uh, in the first snowfall we had of uh, the season when the snow was still fun. Uh, we got there and uh, 
enjoyed myself uh, for about an hour taking pictures of the of the whole thing. Um, and you can see the, the house peeking out there, the, the, uh, uh, the larger house, Kurt Linear house in the background there. One of the ideas that I was looking at in the, in the shape of this was that the, as you saw in the plan, the house itself is a very serpentine kind of quality. Um, in contrast, the plan of the meditation hut is, is a strict rectilinear geometry. And then the house itself has a flat section Meditation on it has a curve section. So it's a way of kind of complementing building to building by uh, starting to play with some of those effects. Uh, one of the, the really phenomenal things that I was able to explore with this project was the idea of reflected light from the water. Um, and this is one of the things, and uh, my plan now is to actually start to record some of this in, in video uh, because. The, the, the effect of, of reflected light, uh, or light reflected from water, I think, is really quite beautiful and quite mesmerizing and calming. Um, and this works quite well. It's one of the reasons that we went with the V-shaped roof, and it's kind of an exaggerated, um, embracing type of roof that really does, uh, as the, the, the sun moves uh, through the different seasons, of course, now it's iced over, so uh, you don't get this effect. But as, a, as the sun raises in the summer and lowers uh, in the fall and is lower in the spring, you get the light casting onto various aspects or various portions of the interior. So it's constantly changing throughout the, the seasons. You can also see the approach ramp there. And uh, I guess it's the next slide, yeah. Uh, on the left, you see the approach lamp, uh, ramp with some uh, light coming through it. And on the right, you see an interior detail. And one of the things I was trying to do architecturally with this was to really uh, create a transformation between the interior experience and the exterior experience. The exterior is uh, especially something like this, where you, you start to get a kind of staccato effect with light and shade. It becomes very exciting, very kind of uh, exaggerated and in a way stimulating. The, I wanted to do the opposite inside, to make very calming, refined types of details. Simple palette of materials, black painted steel column, um, uh, drywall plaster with, a, with a, 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 a glossy shine on it. And the gloss uh, it has a way of starting to reflect light too. I think you'll see that in some of the interior images. Here's. Um, an image from the, uh, the vestibule looking outside. And um, you can see that the, the floor itself there is, is a dark ebonized uh, plywood which, with glossy paint on it. And what I realized, I guess afterwards, uh, uh, was that it had a kind of water effect too. So once again, this theme of water was coming into it. And as you sit on the meditation hut, you're surrounded by this glossy ebonized saying, which almost feels as if it's a kind of uh, silent or, or a still pool of water. So it has the effect of being an island inside an island. Uh, and then here you see the, the tea cabinet with its own little uh, uh, window on it. The intention is, uh, one thing in development is to uh, create a fountain under this tea cabinet which is connected to a sump that, that drains some local or nearby land, um, and then bring in the, the sound of water to this project, too. Um, and then finally, you have the meditation space itself. Where, and you see that we, once again, went back to this idea of a horizontal window, which only gives you a captured view of water, um, begins to edit out the surrounding area, and gives you very controlled and refined views of the, the place um, itself, as well as uh, views up to the sky. One of the things that's interesting when, when this was during construction is you became, became very aware when we were inside the meditation hut of a family of eagle, of uh, not eagles, hawks, that uh, lived in the area because they always seem to be uh, uh, flying by, along with uh, Kraska's uh, airplanes. Uh, not too far away from here. 
Um, from what those three projects, and we can include the uh, Olympic Tribute, have in common with this, uh, uh, have in common is the fact that they are all built on site. Um, this last project that I want to show you is one where we start to look at uh, other possibilities of architecture. And uh, the, this next project is also more of a collaboration between myself and uh, students that I've been working with. So it kind of moves from the, the research practice mode to the research education mode. Uh, it begins with this idea of, of challenging the idea of building on site. It starts to look at the idea of prefabrication and more specifically flat pack construction. Uh, flat pack construction is something, if anybody's gone to Ikea, they know flat pack construction um, or Target or any big box store. It's basically the idea of, of uh, making very, very small packages with component pieces in it, like you see chairs spelled out here, which then are put together, hopefully with good instructions uh, included in the package, but usually not, um, into uh, some type of piece of furniture. So our, our idea is, well, can you do this with architecture? Can you take it up a, a notch in, in scale and uh, make, make architecture in the same way? Uh, this idea of prefabrication in architecture is nothing new. Um, these these uh, houses might look very familiar to you because there's many of them in the community. And they're all uh, basically from Sears, were, were shipped to site in big pieces and then put together on the site, all pre-measured, pre-cut, and basically assembled. The one on the left was uh, the first house that I lived in uh, in Urbana, and then the uh, one on the right is very similar to the one that my wife and I live in now uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And, and it's amazing, because we can walk around and I'm constantly seeing new examples of the same house in various places. Um, so they're all different. Um, so with that idea, I came up with the notion, I was working with uh, Max Benberg, uh, senior at the time, uh, on this idea of what we call ecopod housing. Um, the idea was also generated by uh, a friend and colleague, Bill Pope, in education, and talking about this idea of, of is it possible to start to do some uh, bigger ideas with this flat pack with prefabricated housing. So we came up with some schemes that looked at this idea of components, and this one is um, uh, a series of uh, almost townhouse type things where you had a living package, a sleeping package, a uh, bathroom package, and then behind there is a kitchen package. And then this top one was uh, the, the, kind of, uh, the one that I like best, it's called the Scholar Study, and we thought we had a little more liberty to work with. The idea was to make it uh, fully sustainable uh, with uh, solar collecting, uh, wind power, uh, things like that. Even a funky Adirondack chair on the uh, patio there. What we discovered though was that it was a, an awful lot to try to do an entire house at once. So uh, I decided to scale down the project and start and take a version of that, uh, uh, looked like a kind of geometric uh, cardinal there, uh, and this called the Scholar Study, and make it into a smaller project we call the Eco Monk. Um, where the name Eco Monk comes from, uh, I don't know, it, it, to me it kind of fits in with this idea of meditation huts and things like that. And uh, get, gets the idea of this quasi independent, self reliant type of structure, which is really what we're after here. Uh, you can see the, uh, we had several advisors who were working with us on this project. I've had some research assistants, uh, support from the research board and campus to work on this. And then a whole series of eco monks, which are listed um, down below there. So I'm going to, uh, and here's some of the uh, ideas of what we thought the eco monk could be used for. There's many more that uh, I can uh, continue to develop here. But we've come to several ideas, and also when I've talked to people and, and told them about the idea or presented the idea, they keep coming up with other ideas for what it could be uh, used for. The uh, process, the sequence that we've devised so far is uh, 
that first the uh, the the eco monk is a is a kind of packed trailer. The the vision is that you could go to a place like IKEA and you could actually order uh, your component, your building piece from the IKEA warehouse or the Target warehouse or whatever, and um, drive it out that day. Next, you uh, would, would take and uh, tilt the, uh, the entire trailer back. And uh, this has actually been calculated so that if you have this lower, uh, I'll show you this another slide, but if you have this lower volume filled with uh, water, and the idea is to bring potable water to the site, um, if you, that will act as a counterweight and actually be able to lift all the building components um, with just the, the lift of a hand. One thing we were looking at was trying to keep the weight of all the pieces very low. Uh, I believe the Army Corps of Engineers has a 35 pound uh, lifting limit for what's considered something that uh, the normal person can lift and put in place. So we've tried to keep the components beyond that. And uh, Montana, who did these calculations, assures me that uh, one could lift it up and bring it down to the site let him try the first time we get this thing built. Anyway, uh, you, you, the, the wet pod, which this piece is called, is uh, put vertically into place. And the idea is that so that you don't have to hand assemble things like uh, the, the, the plumbing, the kitchen, things like that. Those are all pre-made into this piece, which is eight by eight by two and a half feet wide. Uh, it also has the cage that, can, that has all the other components. Um, here you can see the, the foundation being is almost like a series of car jacks, which are then cranked down to level the entire thing. Then the uh, truck or whatever the transport vehicle can be uh, uh, taken away, and you simply have the, uh, the architectural piece here. Uh, I've had several students. Uh, 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 Lily was working on uh, this idea of a, a unfoldable. Uh, furniture unit and would also be packed with various types of supplies. Uh, she calls the, what's the name of it? Uh, this one's the in bed, right? Um, the in bed storage unit. And that would basically take up the space of the void that the entrance through the wet pod uh, would have. I think this is all probably pretty clear and obvious. Uh, the next thing you have a small, very small kitchen unit in the wet pod. Uh, you have the uh, serve uh, heating and air conditioning unit, and this is basically a two-way heat exchanger that brings in air and uh, extracts moisture, changes it both into hot and cold, and it's based on the design that uh, Tiny Wool is, uh, is developing and has developed to uh, run the Zequinox house, which is, a, uh, a, is just uh, opened up in Barringer Commons in Urbana. So we've had some really top-notch consultants uh, who have been interested in this and worked with us on this uh, type of project. Uh, then we've also had uh, some students last semester studying the idea of, of rainwater collection, of uh, rainwater harvesting, of uh, looking at, uh, at the humidifying or the uh, dehumidifying of air from the condenser and how that can be worked into the whole system. So the, the, the system would actually uh, generate its own water supply too. We're also looking at the idea of a composting toilet, uh, which has a, a, a wind uh, ventilator piece on there to keep uh, odors out of the, the uh, eco monk. Uh, then we would use the, uh, uh, the porch, which the, uh, the, the the cage that holds the panels becomes a porch, and that would also be the way that you would basically be able to empty out the, uh, the waste from this. Uh, then you have the panel system itself, and we've uh, been able to engineer a method where we have uh, only about three different types of panels to build this whole thing out, and uh, each of them can be put into place with um, only a, a couple of hand tools, and the intention is that one or two people could put this assemblies together in an afternoon. Uh, we also have students working on projects like this, um, which is a, uh, uh, I 
Okay, what's that? Ecobunk, right. The Ecobunk, which is a, a kind of a nested um, bunk system there, which would be outside of it. So you could actually turn uh, the Ecobunk into some type of uh, barracks type situation. Uh, this is also being continued. We worked on uh, this semester, and uh, I've been assured that we'll have a, a working prototype by the end of the semester. Then you have roof panels, and the idea of the roof panels was to begin to integrate solar film onto it. And uh, you can see the seminar working on EcoBunk at uh, Ty's, in Ty's backyard. Uh, most people in this area have, have, have lawns and lawn furniture in the backyard, but Ty has a solar array, so you know, it makes it a little bit different. Uh, then you have this, uh, this piece called Sprout which uh, is being developed in order to look at how some of these panels can be translated into vertical green walls. And this is another continuing project where we're, we actually have a sample panel that you can see uh, on the upper right. And uh, the uh, growing medium the seeds, I think, are beginning to, uh, are, are planted and should be growing very soon. So that's pretty much where, where we are on the project. We have a, uh, a, a framework done. Where we're starting to work on the wet cotton. We're beginning to uh, continue to develop this. And uh, this is uh, basically just a, an image where I've, I've superimposed the uh, eco-monk into the landscape that we first saw with the prospect and refuge sites. So it's, it kind of shows the continuity, but also maybe uh, an evolution of thinking from pieces that are very uh, ingrained and locked in the landscape to pieces that can actually be more flexible and serve uh, a, a series of purposes uh, in the environment. Also going back to the original quote that, um, uh, that I had from uh, Kenneth Frampton, and I have a short uh, conclusion that I'd just like to uh, read to you here. Um, although the peculiarities of a particular place, to quote Professor Frampton, create a framework or concept text for formal decision making, my desire to create meaningful spaces comes from a deeper, more personal source. This quotation from uh, Elaine Bedoe Belton from The Architecture of Happiness suggests the possible appeal of these spaces. Quote, we value certain buildings for their abilities to rebalance our misshapen natures and encourage emotions which our predominant commitments force us to sacrifice. This quotation reminds me of an earlier one from the great Mexican architect Luis Barragan. Quote, any work of architecture which does not express serenity is a mistake, unquote. These two quotations succinctly describe what I value and strive to achieve as an architect, to construct environments of commemoration and introspection that evoke the human spirit, public places that bring people together, and conversely, private places that allow people to find refuge in quiet contemplation. The work reflects my desire to identify and seek out creative ways to resolve the conflicts of living in the everyday world, or allow creative ways for people to resolve the conflicts of living in the everyday world, as well as my desire to honor our undeniable connection to other places and other times. And then to express these values through the mute but material-rich medium of architecture. Thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions if you would have any. There's a microphone up there so that you can actually hear the questions. Oh. Jeez. 
please have a question. Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Hi, Sharon. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, and I, I don't mean to um, diminish what you've already done on EcoMonk, but I wondered, since it is so cold outside, if you talk about maybe how this thing could be insulated or weatherized, and whether you're going to move in that direction. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one of the ideas is to start to look at the notion of alternative way, methods of insulation. And I'm actually interested in the idea of, of uh, the, the possibility of using soybeans as, uh, as an insulating material, and, and also as a cladding material, the, the plasticizing qualities and things like that. So there's a whole area of research of looking at more sustainable types of insulation and cladding materials that What's interesting about a small project like this is you can move it in so many different directions. And that's one of the directions that I think I'd really love to take it in. So that not only is it generating its own energy, but it's also um, really sustaining its own heat or cold or whatever within it. Thanks for the question. So, um, one of the things I'm really struck by in your work is that some of these buildings are unbelievably grounded. I mean, they're just of, you know, coming from a landscape architecture department, thank you for that. They're utterly of the earth, they emerge out of it, and where the ground ends and the building begins, I can't tell. And yet some of the others are completely the opposite, in that they float above it, they, you know, one of them comes in on a cart on wheels, you could park it in my backyard, you could park it in your backyard, it is completely not site specific. So it's like you're working with these diametrically opposed ideas about sight. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's true. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in the whole notion of, of sight and how it impacts the things. I, I think maybe starting, well, starting at the end with the, with the EcoMunk project, I, I really looked at that as, um, uh, a vehicle for the study of a whole series of different issues. And uh, one of them is portability, and is this idea of, of place versus displacement, maybe. Um, and then you take something like the Olympic Tribute, which I thought needed to be grounded because of its symbolic intent with the place itself. So I, I, to me, it, the architecture has a continuum. And then, the meditation huts, one of the reasons that I didn't do the, well, there's several reasons I did the, I did them on stilts. Um, the first two were so that it could actually be eliminated or removed from the site, and the site, that space could actually be returned to the landscape, to the ground. So, you know, looking at it as, as um, a stewardship issue, I guess, would be that. So I would I would agree with you. There is a continuity of them, and I really I could have set up the lecture so that it was all about pieces that were embedded in the ground, because all the memorials I've done have really been anchored. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to show that continuity, which you you know I think uh, indicated from your observation here. Um, I I don't know what else to say. Maybe you have more to say about that. But, but I, I just think that um, to keep it interesting, you have to keep trying different things. And also just the, the method, when you start to make things, I think different, um, different conclusions come from the different conditions. Site being one, materials being another. Um, certainly the idea of putting it up on stilts because of the flooding condition was an absolute imperative. And that's one of the things that's interesting about this landscape is that the groundwater is so close that the relationship of the ground to the building becomes very critical in the design. And so you could almost look at that as another condition that starts to interplay with all these things too. Thanks for that observation. Anybody else?
Thanks, Jeff. It's beautifully done. It's a delight to have you on our faculty. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And to everyone else, thanks for waving the elements to come out and be part of this reception just outside. So we'll see you there in a minute. Thank you. Thank you.